Hey everybody, I'm JJ, you're watching Reality Survival, and today I just wanted to share an article with you that I uh, found on DefenseOne.com. Uh, the title of this article, and I'll put the link down in the description below so you guys can see it and go follow all the links to the reports that it's talking about. The title of this article is Shield Critical Infrastructure from Electromagnetic Pulses, DHS Says. Now I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. Um, it's only a few paragraphs long. Uh, but uh, I, I want to stress to you the importance that the government is worried about protecting themselves and their infrastructure from an electromagnetic pulse. Maybe you should be thinking about that too. Um, at the end of this, I'll, I'll talk to you about a few different ways that you can help protect yourself uh, from this. But after, or you know, let me go ahead and read this article first so you understand where this article is coming from. So the subtitle is, the National Public Warning System offers a model for defending other vital uh, systems and services. The Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate on Tuesday released a report outlining a series of best practices that local, state, and federal agencies and private sector partners should implement to protect critical infrastructure services from electromagnetic pulses. DHS's Electromagnetic Pulse Shielding Mitigations Report, and there's a link to it in here, um, which, in, which includes input from Federal Man <coughs> Emergency Management Agency, excuse me, I'm still dealing with COVID, <coughs> uh, input from the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency, Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. Uh, and feedback from industry and government representatives. And this builds on best practices used to protect the national public warning system. A network of radio stations that allows an, an, the N, NPWS, the National Public Warning System, is a network of radio stations that allow the U.S. President to communicate with the American public during a national emergency. FEMA's Integrated Public Alert and Warning System program includes 77 private sector broadcast stations that use multiple connected EMP protected shelters and are equipped with backup communications equipment and a power generator to ensure that the information can be broadcast through the National Public Warning System without any EMP related interruptions or interference. According to DHS, FEMA uh, has also conducted high altitude EMP testing on the National Public Warning System equipment to verify that mitigation efforts are protecting these stations. Electromagnetic pulses, whether caused by an intentional EMP attack or a naturally occurring geomagnetic disturbance from severe space weather, could disrupt critical infrastructure such as electric grid, communications equipment, water and waterway systems, and transportation nodes. Catherine Coulter of Catherine Coulter Mitchell, DHS senior official performing the duties of the Undersecretary for Science and Technology, said in a statement. Quote, this could impact millions of people over large parts of the country. It is critical to protect against the potential damage of an EMP event could cause, end quote. In a press release, DHS said the best practices and principles outlined in the report can be implemented by critical infrastructure owners and operators who seek to secure their assets against EMP in a similar manner to the NPWS equipment. When deciding how to best protect critical infrastructure and related assets from EMPs, the report says that agencies and private sector operators should consider systems, architecture, and design, location, geography, materials, points of entry that allow external electromagnetic energy penetrations and ancillary equipment, and beyond, access, beyond assessing and remedying potential vulnerabilities in their systems, the report says that efforts to guard critical infrastructure from an EMP should also consider the impact that an outage would have on needed services. We're almost finished here. Um, quote, if temporary outages are not acceptable, then the most stringent protection approach should be followed, end quote, the report says. Quote again, if system outages or time urgency are not critical, then critical infrastructure owners and operators can take less onerous protection approaches that are accompanied by operator in interference, such as powering down and restarting the system or repairing the equipment using readily available spare parts." End quote. Two more paragraphs here. <coughs> Sorry about the hacking. 
In March 2019, then-President Donald Trump issued an executive order to bolster the federal government's resilience to EMPs. It promoted cross-government information sharing and called for agencies and critical infrastructure operators to engage in risk-performing, risk-informed planning and to prioritize research and development needed to respond and recover from EMPs. CISA has also worked to build long-term resiliency in the public and private sectors by helping critical infrastructure owners and operators participating in EMP-related testing and identifying effective EMP mitigation technologies. CISA remains committed to work with our partners uh, to implement requirements outlined in the executive order on coordinating national resilience to electromagnetic pulses, which strengthens our nation's preparedness from EMP. And that is from a quote by Mona Harrington, the acting assistant director of CISA's National Risk Management Center. Okay, so basically the government is starting to become concerned about how to protect their infrastructure um, with or from electromagnetic pulses. So as I said earlier, maybe you should think about that too. Now, I don't know how to, how to assess what that risk is, but what I do know is that generally speaking, if a government is concerned about something and they start passing these things out to other parts of the, of the government and they start putting down these decrees, then that means that it's ramping up on the threat level for them and they wanna make sure that everybody is in compliance. So what can you do? The number one thing uh, you need to think about with an electromagnetic pulse is what do what do I do to be able to insulate myself from that attack as much as possible okay and just a real quick description on what that attack is an electromagnetic pulse can be caused primarily by a couple of different things one is a geomagnetic storm like a big coronal mass ejection or solar flare in which case you're going to see a lot of damage to the long transmission lines where we get our power from. It's probably not going to be so much of an issue with small handheld electronics, um, but it's going to be the, the, basically the power grid itself would be affected and um, would be down for quite a long time, multiple years in fact. So then the other type of way that it can be affected is from a high altitude um, nuclear detonation where a nuclear bomb detonates about 300 or so kilometers um, above the center of the United States and the, the resulting uh, electromagnetic wave from that could basically knock out the majority of the electric grid in the United States. And if they did two of them, then they, they could definitely get all of it. One of them probably be enough, depending on the height and the yield of the weapon and all that kind of stuff. But essentially, uh, if, if some adversarial country like Russia or Iran or North Korea or whatever was able to sneak in a bomb and, and detonate it like that, then the power grid would go down and it wouldn't come back up for a very long time. Um, a really long time. <laughs> uh, so you need to think about what do I do to insulate myself from that? Well, the, the number one thing that you have to understand about an EMP blast is, is this is a worst case scenario. If the, if the electric grid went down for an extended period of time in the United States, this is a very, very bad thing because uh, you're going to have chaos ensuing on a wide scale. The uh, congressional report on uh, the study for um, electromagnetic pulse detonations and you hear this a lot this stat thrown out a lot uh, basically estimated that about 90 percent of people would die within two years well why is that well there's a lot of reasons for it there's uh, people freezing to death people um, dying in you know from heat exhaustion people who live in the desert and people who live in extreme northern climates people who don't have their medications who can't get their diabetes medication and all that kind of stuff and then, in addition to that, uh, lack of medical treatment, not being able to do preventative care, you know, and stuff like that. Then uh, you've got civil unrest uh, on top of that. When the power is out, what that means is, is that vehicles are not going to work. They, that same study estimated that about 60 to 70 percent of vehicles would be affected by an EMP. That's a lot. Um, some vehicles may still run 
some vehicles might run intermittently or you know not that great or they may have to have minor uh, repairs done to them but when you remove 70 percent of vehicles from the transportation network that means that food is not going to be showing up to the grocery stores that means that fuel is not going to be available for your vehicles so what do you do to insulate yourself from this the first thing that you want to do is you want to basically think as locally as you possibly can think about your house your your area your land okay you want to have a backup power system have, make sure that you have a generator and the associated fuel to go along with that okay and you want to try to be able to power your critical systems when needed for as long as you can now obviously a solar system because we're talking about a couple of years here um, that that would be the, the long-term scenario in this uh, a couple of years or more so a solar system would be the preferred way to go if you had a solar system uh, at least uh, even a solar generator like the Ocatel or the Blue Eddy or the um, EcoFlows any of those solar generators are great because they're going to give you um, you know a pretty good power capacity and then you can recharge that with solar so you would at least be able to have a certain amount of power you know to keep your refrigerators running and stuff like that now you could also you could also look at having um, you know propane generators and um, you know gasoline generators and then having you know large agricultural tanks or whatever to store a lot of fuel so that they could last longer you could cycle, you know, not run those all the time, but you could cycle those, you know, maybe a few hours a day or something like that to get the the maximum amount of, of life out of it as possible. That's going to give you a big advantage because it's going to be able to give you um, some light so that you can be a little bit more productive during the dark hours. It's going to be able to give you potentially um, localized security systems to maybe be able to to help see around your house or whatever. Um, you know, there's 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 lots of different potential uh, benefits from this, depending on how you have your house set up and all that kind of stuff. Another thing that you can do is you can make sure that your house and your cars have an EMP shield on them. Now you can go to EMPShield.com. You can check out their devices. They have a, a wide range of devices to protect all different things, from solar arrays to generators to houses, your whole house your vehicles, you could put them on ATVs, tractors, boats, all, all different kinds of things. Um, so take a look at their thing. You can use the discount code Reality Survival to save $50 per unit. So if you looked at getting, you know, say four units or something like that, a couple of cars, a couple of free cars, one free generator, one for your solar array or whatever, then you could save a couple hundred bucks. And I highly recommend this. The reason that I recommend this is because these devices have been tested by Keystone Compliance Labs to be in accordance with military specs. So uh, I don't think that Keystone Compliance is going to put their reputation on the line to say that these devices work if they really didn't. So they're a third party. They don't have any interest. They're not, they're not uh, affiliated with EMP Shield in any way. So uh, I know that, that that system, Keystone Compliance Company, also does testing for uh, Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security, like you heard mentioned in this article and stuff like that. Uh, they were just talking about testing and stuff in the article, not that Keystone did it, but companies like them do that stuff. So get something to make sure that you protect your house and your vehicle. Now think about the advantage that that has if you're at work and an EMP goes off then if you have to walk home, how far do you work from home? Are you 30 miles, 50 miles, or 70 miles like me? I'm 70 miles if I have to go into work to the office. That's a long ways to have to walk and it's gonna take me a long time to get home. Now, I would much rather have the option to be able to drive that way, even if the traffic's gonna be chaotic and even if I have to push vehicles out of the way with my truck and all that, whatever the case may be, I would much rather have the option to drive to be able to cover more ground more quickly. And that is why I have an EMP shield on my truck and I'm getting ready to install one on my wife's car as well. And I'll do a video on that when we do. 
Okay, so you got to have a power system. You got to protect that power system. Um, you need to protect your vehicle. Make sure that your vehicle, um, it, you know, you always keep it more than a half tank of gas in it. And you also need to think about food and water for your house. You got to, you got to have, you got to be able to maintain in this kind of a situation. Um, you really want to have a layered food system. So a you know, a pantry that will hold you over for at least three months if possible. And then you want to look at having um, additional dry goods stored. So you can go to the uh, LDS pantry. You can get a lot of those staples like the rice, beans, oats, you know, the spaghetti bites, the, the potato flakes and all that kind of stuff. It's essentially most all that stuff is a lot of carbs except with the exception of the beans and you get some, some uh, protein there. But and then you want to, in a system where you knew that the, the, the grid was, was broken down, where there's not going to be food at the store anymore, then you want to start layering in those bulk dried foods so that your pantry would last longer and you could keep the flavor profile with the foods that you like to eat for as long as possible. What you don't want to do is you don't want to eat down your, your food pantry to nothing and then have to transition all into rice and beans and, and oatmeal and all that kind of stuff. That's going to tear your gut up big time. But if you start slowly layering in those foods and, and helping to extend the life of your pantry as long as possible, then your gut and your, your, your biome, basically, uh, inside your gut is going to start to to get more used to those foods and you, when when you actually have to when your all your pantry stuff is gone because it will it will go away eventually then then you're you'll be used to eating those rice and beans if that makes sense so you've got to have a layered system where you layer it in another potential layer that you can layer in there is freeze dried and dehydrated foods from a ver a variety of different companies. Uh, one company that I partnered with recently is uh, Nutrient Survival, and they have some pretty good tasting food. I'm I'm actually going to do a full review on that here pretty soon. Um, they I think that they are right up there with Mountain House, if not a little better. They're not Mountain House. A lot of times is a little too salty for some people. This stuff doesn't doesn't taste that way to me. Um, it's it's really a pretty good stuff, but it is a little bit expensive. And most of the companies nowadays are pretty expensive. But the benefits that, the, that you get from having those kinds of foods is, again, that you get a, a flavor profile that you can stand eating and you can supplement that in with those rice and beans to make it last even longer. So you might get one or two buckets of uh, food from, from any of these companies, and that bucket, if you ate only the bucket, would probably only last you a week or two weeks or whatever. But if you supplement it in with the rice and beans and everything else and try to make it, these uh, meals last longer and go further, then it might, it might last you a month or two months or whatever the case may be. So you got to have a layered food system. You also need to have water. you got to think about how are you going to be able to get water to maintain hygiene, to cook, to clean, to do all the things that you normally do in your house. If you want to maintain the same style of living or as close as possible, what is it that Bear from Bear Independence says? Uh, perpetuate normalcy for the people that you love, right? That's your goal in trying to be able to do this. What that means is, is you got to be able to go out and you got to be able to collect water on a big scale. We're talking five to eight gallons per person per day. When you start to have to wash clothes by hand, when you have to wash all your dishes by hand, when you have to start taking showers and all that kind of stuff, you're going to burn through water quickly. What I recommend is having three different water filters. I think there's three key filters that are really important across the board. The first one is a port -a well I'll have an affiliate link in the description below. And I'm affiliates with these companies for a reason because I think that they're the best companies out there that are going to help people the most in a critical situation like this. port -a well basically takes a pump and a couple of filter housings and it puts it together so that you can move, you can pump a high amount of water quickly 
into a big transportation container. So if you have an ATV or something like that, you can put a small, you know, like 25 gallon ag tank, like a sprayer tank on the back. Um, you can use five gallon buckets. You can use whatever, you know, whatever m method you want to carry it. But you can, you can take this pump to the water source. You can pump it out. It runs it through a couple of filters. You can even get an add-on unit and do like I did in some of the videos where you can run it through four filters and then it puts it into your container. And that way when you get the water at home and you're uh, going to use it, it's already been through a set of filters and it's probably mostly safe to drink. However, if you're going to use it the, for the drinking water, I recommend you also run it through a gravity filter. So a filter like a Big Berkey or an Alexa Pure Pro, either one of those are fine. I tend to, to like the Alexa Pure Pro just slightly better because I think their candle uh, filter design is better. It's a little bit more sturdy and it filters out just slightly more stuff, but both of them are good. Okay, they're, they're both really good. So you got to have a gravity system to filter the water that you're going to drink on a daily basis and that you're going to cook with. You know, it's just probably a good idea to do that. Then the last one, is, the last filter that I think you should have is a Caden Pocket water filter. It's pretty expensive also, but it's it's the best designed filter on the market and it will last a very long time if you take care of it. It'll filter a lot of water and that is the, the kinds of filters that you would use if you were forced out of your house in a bug out kind of situation and you needed to be able to to filter water in the field. Okay, that's that's where that one would come in. I think with those three filters you're going to have your water situation covered. So you've got power generation, you've got food, you've got water. You also need to think about medical, all right? Now, I partnered with Refuge Medical a few months back because I think that they have the best medical kits out there right now. They're the most comprehensive kits that I've seen on the market and they use very good components. And they're, they're thinking about the holes in the system that a lot of people aren't thinking about. They're not just thinking about the trauma kits. They have a full line of trauma kits, the Barefac 3.0, the uh, small of the back kit, the advanced rip away kit, the, uh, the pocket kit that you can carry in your pocket. They've got a whole line of different trauma kits. But above that, and what I think is really important is the aftercare products. So the wound buckets, it, you, you need a couple of buckets full of gauze and different bandages and stuff like that to be able to take care of any wounds that you might receive. If you have a trauma kit and you think that you could potentially get shot in a gunfight, but you don't have an aftercare kit to take care of that, then you're not thinking things through. That gunshot is going to have to have its bandages changed for six weeks straight every day. That takes a ton of material. Those buckets are basically made for a 30-day treatment afterwards. So I think everybody should have at least two of those wound care buckets. If you use the discount code Reality Survival, it'll save you 20% off, I think. Um, or maybe it's 10%. Okay, it's, I think it's 10%. Anyway, check the link in the description below. Go to refugemedical.com and use the discount code Reality Survival. It will save you some money. It's really important though that you, you think about your medical situation. If you, if you could imagine what it would be like if the electric grid was down and you could think about the kind of chaos that would happen at that level, you need to really start thinking about security. Okay, and, and part of security means that you have to realize that you could potentially be engaged in some sort of a dispute, some sort of a firefight, some sort of something, you know, whatever the case may be, because people are going to be looting, people are going to be trying to come to your house and other people's houses. There's going to be a period of time for several weeks to a couple of months that it's going to probably be pretty violent out there. You're going to need to protect yourself and your family. So, um, and part of doing that is having the right medical. Now, obviously, since we were just talking about security, you also need to be able to have the firearms and all the you know ammo and associated things that you're going to need to take care of that aspect for you, depending on where you live, whatever is works best for you. That's your call. Um, I recommend the, the, the guns that I recommend that people have um, for a situation like this where it is a grid down situation and you basically 
have a severely disrupted rule of law system. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and police and fire services and all that kind of stuff are probably not going to be um, helping you because they are going to be worried about protecting their own infrastructure and their own system, if they're even functioning at all. Okay, so you're going to have to defend yourself. So, handguns. My personal recommendation is a nine millimeter semi-automatic handgun. The size and uh, and model and make and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't really matter to me, but I think a, the, the best starting point if you don't have any firearms is a you know mid-sized firearm, something that you can carry, something that can have a capacity of at least you know 13 to 15 rounds and um, you know something that's going to be effective an effective fighting pistol. all right that's the first one. The second thing is is a good, home defense shotgun, 12 gauge shotgun or 20 gauge shotgun, it doesn't really matter. Um, whether or not you go with a semi-automatic or a pump, that doesn't matter. You can go with the Remington, um, uh, 700, seven, no, not 700s. Why am I, why am I, <laughs> my computer closed down here. Um, Mossberg 590 and Remington 700, is that what it is? Why am I, I'm brain farting on this. Anyway, whatever the popular Remington pump model is, um, those are going to work just fine. Home defense shotguns, all right? And that's that's going to work. That's going to be one good layer. Um, I think also AR-15s make a lot of sense, especially um, in being able to um, work out at distances a little bit further and because it's such a popular platform and a lot of people train with them and that kind of thing. Then... You need to also consider um, long-term food procurement. So you might look at some sort of a centerfile rifle with a uh, scope on it. So um, like a 308 Winchester or a 6.5 Creedmoor are both great options. And that way you can be able to reach out and touch those four-legged critters like, you know, deer, elk, moose, you know, big game, that kind of stuff. Because that's going to be um, really important to be able to procure that kind of meat. And last but not least, uh, I think that was last, right? Nine shotgun, AR, rifle, oh, and then uh, a 22 long rifle. 22 long rifle is important in this kind of situation for getting small game and because it's a lot easier to stockpile a larger amount of ammunition with a 22 than it is for, say, a 223 or 9 mil or a 6.5 Creedmoor or even a 12 gauge. Eventually, we're talking about a multiple year period here, right? This is this is a, a big hypothetical event. If if an EMP actually went off, you're talking about several years until power came back on. What is the what is the probability that you're going to start running out of your 223 ammo, your you know uh, long distance ammo, and your shotgun ammo? It's probably pretty high. Well, at some point, you might have to actually be at the point where you're relying on a 22 long rifle as your primary defense weapon. How crappy would that be? That would be crappy. I'm not saying it's a good option, but what I'm saying is is when you when you start to think on a long scale and you plan this stuff out, how long could you potentially last with the ammo that you have for those larger rifles? Most people don't have tens of thousands of rounds stocked. Now, maybe some people on this channel do, okay? And then there's also the probability of <laughs> whether or not you could live through actually using that many rounds, right? Especially if it was in some sort of a firefight because it's kind of a fantasy to think that you're you know, gonna get through uh, numerous firefights or engagements and not suffer some severe medical consequences. But anyway, on a long enough timeline, you, or perhaps maybe it's not you because maybe you get killed in the fighting, maybe it's your sons or your grandkids or whatever the case down the line, you might have to actually rely on 22s. So <coughs> I also think it makes sense to have semi-automatic 22 rifles as part of your um, preparations. Okay, uh, let's see here. Last thing uh, we'll talk, talk about here real quick is um, we'll talk about 
uh, transportation. So again, I talked a little bit earlier about having an EMP on your EMPS shield on your vehicle. Again, discount code Reality Survival save you fifty dollars. Link is in the description below. Having a vehicle, a lot of people were like, "Well, the gas stations won't be open, so what's the use in having a vehicle?" Well, the use in having a vehicle is is that a lot of those sixty to seventy percent of vehicles that are sitting around dead is going to have gas in them for a long time. Now, if you have the ability to go and siphon the fuel from that, or punch a hole in the tank and catch it with a, you know, an oil drain pan or something like that, then you can take and transfer that gas into your vehicle, and your vehicle could potentially run for quite a while. Now, what that does is that extends your ability to operate outside of your local area to gather resources and different things like that. So that makes a whole lot of sense in the situation in that, uh, you know, like that, like that does. Um, is it going to make you a target? Of course it is everything is going to make you a target in that kind of environment. You have to operate in that kind of environment with the complete assumption that you're always under surveillance and you're always about to be attacked. You have to operate in that environment that way with that mindset because you're literally living in a combat zone at that point if something like this were to ever happen. So having some vehicles, having an ATV, having a tractor, if you live in a rural area, that makes a whole lot of sense as well. You really should have the ability to um, to move yourself from one point to another in a quick way, some way. Maybe that's dirt bikes for you. Maybe it's um, you know ATVs or UTVs. Maybe it's you know who knows. There's lots of different options out there. Old trucks, you know, pre 1980s vehicles with you know no um, um, electronics in them, you know, except for um, the points and, and the uh, condenser and all that kind of stuff. That would be fine. Um, have some sort of transportation plan to be able to get around. Those are the things that you want to worry about in a situation like this. So anyhow, that's just a quick off the top of my head um, kind of what I'm thinking about after I see this article from the DHS talking about and telling public entities and other government agencies and all that kind of stuff that they should be prepared for electromagnetic pulses. So that probably means you should think about those things too. Now, do I think that this is a very high probability event? No, I don't. I don't think it's a very high probability event. I think it's a pretty low probability event. However, if you asked me, you know, a year ago if I thought we were going to go to war with Russia, or you know, be in a proxy war with Russia, I probably would have said that's a low probability event too. So I recognize my own bias. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, so maybe it's in, maybe it's important to start thinking about some of these things and uh, taking some steps to be a little bit more proactive to make sure that you could at least get home from work. Yeah, I mean, it seems like an easy thing to me. The Putting in these EMP shields is super easy. It's four wires. I think it's four wires. You got one that goes to the ground, uh, the chassis. You got one wire that goes to the negative terminal. You got one that goes to the positive terminal. And maybe it's just three. And maybe one other one. I can't remember. It's three or four wires. But anyway, it's super easy to put in. So uh, it literally takes like 15 minutes if you got the parts and everything laid out and all that kind of stuff. It's not a big deal at all. Same thing going uh, with hooking it up to your house. It's really not difficult. But if it offers you a level of protection so that you can have a little bit more normalcy, then I think it's a smart plan. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Appreciate you listening to me ramble, and uh, don't forget to live the six Ps. Proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. Stay safe, guys.